folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. It's been a while, uh, and I gave you some things to look at while I was on vacation. Hopefully you did your homework because we're dealing with Matthew chapter 24 and what we're calling the mystery of mysteries. And if you watch the last program that we did on this, you sort of got an idea of where we're going with this. We're looking at practically every mystery religion, every secret society, every, every secret club organization, going all the way back to ancient Babylon and Samaria and the secret societies and the secret meetings and the secret conspiracies um, that have taken place since that time up until this day and even into the future because it hasn't happened yet. The events of Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 24 and the stars falling from heaven have not happened yet, but it's my contention that that event is what will initiate the new world order. A lot of people think the new world order is already in place because George Bush on 9-11 came out and said, we hope this brings forth a new world order. Well, if you remember, all the way back to the very first Watchman broadcast, which was in January in 2009, Henry Kissinger came out on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange after our glorious, wonderful government bailed out, not the American people, the great American banks for which we're, we're all indebted to, literally, and said, we hope this, this event would bring forth what we call the New World Order. Well, it didn't. There's only one thing, Henry, that's going to bring, that, that literally is going to change everything and bring in the devils and all the conspiracy uh, people and all the secret societies and all the groups there's only one thing that's going to bring in their new world order. And that's what we find in Matthew chapter 24. Let's read it again. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. If you remember last time we were together on this, I showed you a tarot card that practically depicted this event with, with the exception of like, you know, stars falling. Just hold on to that because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually read to you what that tarot card actually means today, okay? But the, it, it, this is like when the, some people say well, we're already in the new world order. Some people say we're not. I'm telling you that when the sun goes dark and the moon turns to blood and a third of the stars fall from heaven, it won't be something that most people won't notice. In other words, like one guy says, did you see that? See what? Well, the sun's dark and the moon turned to blood and like, mo like a third of the stars fell from heaven to the earth. I didn't see anything. I guarantee you, 
everybody in the world is going to take notice of that day. And when that day comes, that will be the initiation day of the new, the Novus Ordo Seclorum, the New World Order, the day when everything on earth will be changed. And it will be noticed by everybody. Everybody on the earth is, because I get stuff all the time from people saying, Pastor, I, I read a website or I watched a YouTube video and this guy seems to think that we're already in the trumpet judgments already and that the seals have already been opened and we're back. No. Mm -mm. We're not there yet. I, I'm not sure. I can't say we're not even close. I can't say how close we are or aren't. I'm just saying it hasn't happened yet. But what I am saying is when this event takes place, I guarantee you it's going to be noticed. Now, to me, the significant part of this is the day that the, the sun is dark and the moon is turned to blood, and then a third of the stars are going to fall from heaven to the earth. That's going to bring about Daniel chapter 2, where the fourth kingdom, where it says they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, that fourth kingdom is what we're wrestling, wrestling against and will continue to wrestle against until we're taken out of here, principalities and powers and rulers, rulers of the darkness of this world, that's stars. Spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. That's stars. Okay? So when these four things, these four types of spirits, cast out of heaven to the earth, they will initiate a process of joining themselves with mankind. Thus, Daniel chapter 2 Verse, uh, what is it? 43, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's the day that that, that's the day I believe the mark of the beast will occur. I, I could be wrong on this. I could be seeing two different things and mashing them together when they're not supposed to be mashed together. I could be wrong on that. But I think it's at least around that event if it's not that event itself. But to me, these falling of the stars is the most significant event to ever take place in human history, second only to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection for the sins of mankind. Because now these devils have been kicked out of their first estate in heaven, and now they're here on earth, and they are used to being in charge. What's the whole uh, mystery of astrology about? It's the stars are in charge. You do whatever the stars tell you to do, that's what you do. When someone cat forecasts your astrological events or whatever, when someone goes to an astrologer, the astrologer tells them, oh, you're born in Pisces and this and, the, and because the house of Pisces is in the house of Jupiter and Mars and th then this is going to happen to you. And oh, okay, here's your $350. Thanks for telling me that because that's pro I'm going to follow that. They're, all re they're already following and doing what those stars, those angels, those spirits, evil spirits are telling them to do. They're already doing it. So when they come down here to earth, I guarantee you, guarantee you, the superior beings are always in charge of the inferior beings. Look at the history of planet earth. 
those who are more advanced technologically and more civilized always take over those who are weaker than they are as far as warfare is concerned, who aren't as civilized as they are, who aren't as advanced technologically as they are. That's how it's always happened, and it's going to happen again that same way. Now, I want to illustrate something to you. I want you to look on the screen. There's two stones here. One of them is all misshapen, and it's like, you know, they just kind of did a, you know, not so tidy job of ripping the stone out of the quarry. And then next to it, you have a stone that is smooth. It's got 90 degree corners. It's got smooth edges. Real nice, real pretty. That's what you would build, you know, some big temple or building with. Those are called in Masonic terms. Amongst the stone masons that go all the way back to ancient Europe and now amongst Freemasons who never touch a brick in their life, but they're masons, okay? The, this called the rough ashlar and the smooth ashlar. And the rough ashlar or stone represents man, how he is right now. Man is imperfect. He is misshapen. He doesn't do everything right. He makes a lot of mistakes. Um, he is a bad person on and on. Civilization, you know, it crumbles. Everything decays. The smooth ashlar, according to masonry, is the same ashlar as the rough ashlar, but masonry has taken over this man's life, and masonry has made this man into the perfected state that he is. You see, masonry speaks of what's termed the new man. Homo novus. The new species of mankind. And only the work of the tools of the workman, the Freemason, can turn that rough ashlar into the smooth ashlar. Now, let me sort of bring this back to Bible Christian terms. Yes, the, the rough stone is all of us born into sin, and there's not a thing that we can do about it. Masonry wants you to believe that by your own works, using the mason's tools on your own life, that you can make yourself into the smooth ashlar. And yet, I've known masons in my life who have been some of the crookedest, backstabbingest, drunkards, adulterers, I, I was with my brother-in-law one time when he was had a court appearance. And I noticed, we got there early, and I noticed all the local attorneys were all gathered together talking to the district attorney, and they were cutting up and this and that and the other. They were part of the good old boys club, right? Well, a lawyer came in from probably from St. Louis, the city, not, not from Jefferson County where we are, but from up north where, you know, where he didn't know all the good old boys down here. But he came in, he was a young lawyer, real nice suit, tailored suit, came in wearing a square and compass. Now, why is a lawyer wearing a square and compass when he goes into a courtroom? He's letting the district attorney and the judge know, 
I'm one of you. I'm a Freemason, and my client, let's just give him what's called a square deal, which basically means let's give him a slap on the wrist because I'm a Freemason and we owe each other these kinds of favors. And I guarantee you, whoever that, whoever that lawyer, that Freemasonic lawyer represented, I guarantee you, got off easy. Guarantee you. You see, they are crooked as a dog's hind leg, but they want everybody to believe now that they can make a man good and straight and perfect so that the great architect of the universe accepts him into the celestial kingdom. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. Now, what does that have to do with the stars of heaven falling from the earth? Well, let's take a look at it from Albert Pike, who wrote Morals and Dogma, which was the guidebook for Freemasonry, Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for a hundred plus years. They say they don't use his book any longer, but they do. It's a guidebook. There are newer books that have been written for Masons to learn about Masonry, but all of it derives back from Albert Pike and his teachings and his understanding of Masonry. And here's what Albert Pike said about the rough and the smooth ashlar. He said, aside from the operative aspect of their order, the Dionysiac architect, in other words, those who worshipped Dionysus. Let me, let me stop right here. Dionysus was the, was the same god as Bacchus. And Bacchus and Dionysus were the gods of wine and drunken wine parties, revelings, where you drank a lot of wine and got drunk. And you had orgies. And by the way, Dionysus and Bacchus were both uh, androgynous gods, male, female gods. Yeah. Anyway, the Dionysiac architects had a speculative philosophic code. Human society they considered as a rough, an untrued ashlar, but lately chiseled from the quarry of elemental nature, this crude block was the true object upon which these skilled craftsmen labored, polishing it, squaring it, and with the aid of fine carvings, transforming it into a miracle of beauty. These master workmen achieved liberation from the wheel of life and death by learning to swing their hammers with the same rhythm that moves the swirling forces of the cosmos. Then let me stop right here and explain this. I, I don't think I got it all out earlier. That to us Christians, we're born these rough stones that are imperfect, and we remain that way and we will die that way Unless Jesus Christ, the stone rejected of men, who is the tried and true stone, the stone that was cut out without the hands of man, unless Jesus Christ makes us lively stones that are fit for the temple and the body of Jesus Christ. You see, in masonry, it's all the work of masonry and what masonry does. But in Christianity, it's not about what we do at all. It's about what Jesus does to us. We then, as lively stones, do build up the whole house of God. That's 1 Peter chapter 2. Okay? And to those of us who believe in Christ and trust in his word, that stone of Jesus is precious. But to the world, it's cast aside. They don't want anything to do with it. They would rather choose these thousands of other religious ideologies rather than choose Bible Christianity. 
Okay? Now watch this. Let me, let me read this part again. These master workmen achieved liberation from the wheel of life and death. Let me ex what that, explain what that is. That means the wheel of life and death basically is a cycle of life and death. That all of us are born and all of us must die. They believe that through the workings of the mysteries that you can escape that cycle and live forever. Well, that's what we believe, isn't it? But we believe that it comes through Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, not the workings of the mysteries. Now, uh, these master workmen achieve liberation from the wheel of life and death by learning to swing their hammers with the same rhythm that moves the swirling forces of the cosmos. What is the cosmos? The stars. In order, in other words, when it says moves, when they learn to swing their hammers in the same rhythm of the swirling forces of the cosmos. In other words, when man unites with the cosmos, man will escape the wheel of life and death. Da, da, da. You understand that now? It's the same promise that Satan made in Genesis chapter 3. Eat this fruit and you shall be as gods and you shall not surely die. When man unites with the cosmos, the stars that just fell, then we will escape death. Mm. They venerated the deity under the guise of a great architect. That's what Masons call God and master craftsman who was ever gou uh, gouging rough ashlars from the fields of space and truing them into universes. Turning these rough ashlar stones into the perfect stones of the universe so that we are equal with the stars of heaven, the gods. The Dionysians affirm constructiveness to be the supreme expression of the soul and attuning themselves with the ever visible constructive natural processes going on around them believed immortality could be achieved by thus becoming a part of the creative agencies of nature. In other words, just let evolution take its course. Just let these cosmos, these stars, come down, do what they're going to do to mankind, and mankind will become gods like they are and will escape death and live forever. See, I'm telling you, these stars falling from heaven is the single most important event to take place outside of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the other gospel that Paul said an angel from heaven would bring with him. And he said, when he does, let him be accursed. He also said in Morals and Dogma, you will heal... Sh you will hear shortly of the rough ashlar and the perfect ashlar as part of the jewels of the lodge. The rough ashlar is said to be, quote, a stone as taken from the quarry in its rude and natural state. The perfect ashlar is said to be a stone made ready by the hands of the workmen to be adjusted by the working tools of the fellow craft. In other words, it's all about what... All the secret societies can do and the secrets that they hold, which has everything to do with the joinings of the heavens and the earth together. 
which is when the stars fall from heaven to the earth. That's going to be that day. That when that day occurs, all of us rough, shapen humans will be perfected on that day when man joins with the cosmos. Here's another picture. This is a picture of a capstone. Now, these were rare because it's thought in Egypt that when they built the pyramids, some of them didn't put capstones on them deliberately saying that God was the only capstone. Well, some of them did, and so it's rare to find a capstone that actually sat on top of a pyramid. Well, here's one of them here. Now, this is what Manly Hall, different than Albert Pike, this is what Manly Hall says about the capstone. Remember the back of the $1 bill. You have the unfinished pyramid, right? But then you have hovering over it, not sitting on it, but hovering over it, something that's different than the rest of those stones. Those stones are just stones. What's hovering over that is some illuminated spiritual figure called the all-seeing eye of God or the all-seeing eye of Horus, illuminated, hovering over the top of that pyramid. The pyramid represents mankind. All of the stones represent all. In fact, Manly Hall said there's 72 stones on the back of the $1 bill on, on that pyramid. Well, there's 72 nations in Genesis chapter 10 that make up the whole family of humanity. So you understand now what the 72 stones represent. They represent all of humanity. And, man, and mankind is incomplete until that capstone appears. So here's what Manley Hall said about that capstone. He said the capstone, if it existed, was itself a miniature pyramid. And if you take a look at it, it is. It's a miniature pyramid, the apex of which, again, would be uh, capped by a smaller block of similar shape and so on ad infinitum. The capstone, therefore, is the epitome of the entire structure. Thus, the pyramid may be likened to the universe and the capstone to man. Following the chain of analogy, the mind is the capstone of man, the spirit the capstone of the mind, and God the epitome of the whole, the capstone of the spirit. As a rough and unfinished block, man is taken from the quarry and by the secret culture of the mystery. See how it, there he goes again with capitalizing the word mysteries. And we already know who that is, don't we? It's mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. It's her religion. Her religion says man makes himself a god. God doesn't give man immortality. Man gives it to himself by following the mysteries. And the mysteries are that mankind wants those stars to come down here to the earth, begging them to, to please come down. Remember, I, I did this on a Pastor Mike Online episode not too while ago. I read the lyrics to... Um, interplanetary craft by um, the Carpenters. Read the lyrics to that song, calling all occupants of interplanetary craft. We need you. We want you to come down here. We, 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 we need to join our minds together. You can help us. We want you to come down here and help us. That's what the lyrics are all about. So anyway, the capstone, therefore, is the epitome of the entire structure. Thus, the pyramid may be likened to the universe and the capstone to man. Following the chain of analogy, the mind is the capstone of man, the spirit, the capstone of the mind, and God, the epitome of the whole, the capstone of the spirit. As a rough and unfinished block, man is taken from the quarry and by the secret culture of the mysteries, gradually transformed into a true and perfect pyramidal capstone. The temple is complete 
only when the initiate himself becomes the living apex through which the divine power is focused into the diverging structure below. So the capstone, here's man, incomplete, the pyramid. His mind wants to be perfected, but can't be. Only Manly Hall's version of God, which is not our God. To Manly Hall, God is the whole of the universe, which is the same thing taught in Hinduism and Buddhism and all the Eastern religions, um, that the universe itself, all of it together, is God. So when um, Edgar Mitchell on Apollo 14, sixth man to walk on the moon. He walks on the moon, spends like, I don't know, total of eight hours or more, a couple of days walking on the moon, doing science experiments, this great science, scientific mind, rational, logical thinking man is done with his mission on the moon, and he's taking that long three-day journey back to the earth, and he's looking out the window, and he's pondering all of those stars that he sees out there. All of a sudden, he has a supernatural experience called samadhi. Look that up. S-A-M-A-D-H-I, I think is what it is, or S-A-M-A-H-D-I or something like that, Samadhi. In other words, all of a sudden now, he goes into a trance and he realizes that his body, the molecules of his body, came from a whole line of human species that used to be monkeys, that used to be fish that used to be worms, that used to be germs, that used to be nothing inside of a pool of goo that was created by itself, part of the universe, and that the atoms of his body literally were connected with every atom throughout the universe so that he himself was connected directly to God. That's, that's, what he believe, that's what he believed happened on the way back from the moon. That he was connected directly to God through all the atoms that was in him that was connected to all the other atoms of infinite space around him. Okay? And he, he's dead now. He had, to, he had to go face the real God. Still having that belief in his mind. Okay? But it's the idea that the pyramid is incomplete until the capstone comes down and is added to the pyramid. And once they're joined together, then both of them become complete. That just as much as the pyramid needs the capstone, the capstone needs the pyramid. And there's something about those devils that when they're kicked out of heaven to the earth, there's something about it that says that they need to join with mankind. And they do. We know it happens according to scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Here is our transformation. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This is where everybody has it wrong. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, while everybody else is is either now believing or going to be led to believe, see, because I still think all the atheists of the world and all the people who really don't get it, this whole God's coming to the earth thing, they don't believe in that. They're going to. They're going, they're going to wake up one day and the world's going to be full of angels, full of angels and their chariots and all their different appearances and everything like that. It's going to be full of it. And they're going to have to believe in things that they never believed before. But they still believe that they're going to become gods in this mortal body and attach immortality to mortality. It's like night of the living dead. That's what it is. But our belief coming from the Word of God says, no, let's just go ahead and get rid of this body because it's no good, it's corrupt, it's awful, it's terrible. I'm here to tell you how bad it is. Let's get rid of this body. God says, I'll give you a brand new one and you will have immortality. And it won't cost you anything. You won't have to sell your soul to anything. You just have to believe in the word of God and believe Jesus Christ. And he gives it to us absolutely free of charge. Why? Because he loves us. Now, we know that that change is coming to us. And I mentioned earlier that tarot card where there's a trumpet blowing and you have bodies coming up out of the ground. Let's take a look at it again. So we have an angel blowing a trumpet. And by the way, what symbol is he have on the banner that's on that trumpet? Well, you would say a cross, right? I don't think it's a cross in the sense that it's just, I don't think tarot cards are there to promote Bible Christianity. I don't. I know some people that probably would, that the, the lady that I encountered at the MUFON organization probably would. Because she said she saw Jesus six times. Anyway, no, that's not a cross. That's a chromosome. It's a chromosome. Because Daniel 2 says that when they come, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. And the seed of men is his DNA in all of these chromosomes. That's what I think is on there. Did they know that when they printed that tarot card some two, three hundred years ago? No, not a chance. But the cross, I mean, I just came back from Navajo territory. And I noticed, you know, we went into, uh, we were in Gallup, New Mexico, and they have a lot of Navajo uh, shops there where they sell original Navajo authenticated Navajo art. They have Navajo weavings, and you can tell they're authentic because they're really expensive. And, um, and I noticed that in the, in the Navajo artwork, whether it was sand art 
or the weavings, the tapestries that they wove. The state flag of New Mexico. I even bought a New Mexico hat because I, I thought it was nice and it's got a little cross on it, but that is not a cross. The, the Native Americans were not worshiping Jesus and the cross for the last four or five thousand years. The cross is a universal symbol that I believe points to one of two things. It either points to the cross of Calvary according to the scriptures or it points us to the X chromosome. It points us to a future time when these one third of these angels will fall from heaven and mingle themselves with the seed of men, which is man's DNA coiled up like a serpent and made into these little X-shaped things. So you look again at this trumpet that this angel is blowing. And I think that's what it's referring to because you have all these people rising up out of their coffins. They're, it's, it's like the idea, and, and I've read so much of this in, in Masonic material, uh, Albert Mackey, Albert Pike, um, uh, Manley Hall, and so many others that say the, basically the opposite or the similar thing to what Christianity says. Christianity says that all of us are dead in trespasses and sins, and we need to be, be quickened by Jesus Christ. Well, in the occult world, they say that man is dead because he is like in an animal form. He hasn't, he hasn't evolved out of his lower state yet. So it's like he's dead now. But when the angels come or the visitors come or the aliens come or whatever, whatever secret society calls them, when they come, they are going to resurrect dead mankind to a new life, a new humanity, to be a new man, a new creature, a, uh, a, a new world order, literally, is going to take place on that day. And that's the meaning of that tarot card. So here's what Manley Hall said in Secret Teachings of All Ages. He said the 20th numbered major trump is called Le Judgment, the Judgment, and portrays three figures rising apparently from their tombs. Now, pay attention to something that he says here, because it's going to give away a secret that I think he's trying to conceal. But since we know the Bible, when you see it, you'll go, I know what that is. Okay, now watch this. The judgment portrays three figures rising apparently from their tombs, though but one coffin is visible. Above them in a blaze of glory is a winged figure, presumably the angel Gabriel. I wouldn't presume that. Blowing a trumpet. This tarot represents the liberation of man's threefold spiritual nature from the sepulcher of his material constitution. You see, that's what I was trying to say a while ago, is that the secret societies and the secret teachings believe that man is in a coffin right now. He's dead because he hasn't been elevated to godhood yet. It's like he's dead. He's appointed unto death, which we know is true. And watch this. Since but one-third of the spirit actually enters the physical body, the other two-thirds constituting the hermetic anthropos or 
over man, only one of the three figures is actually rising from the tomb. Did you, did you see that? Did you see that he actually divided two-thirds from one-third? Just like in Revelation 12. But according to him, two-thirds are bad. And one-third is good. But according to scriptures, two-thirds of the angels are on Michael's side fighting one-third of the evil angels, and the evil angels lose and get kicked out of heaven and cast down to the earth. And then he says the overman. You know what that word means? You know how you would say that in German? You would say, Ubermensch. And what that translates back to in English is, Superman. Because Friedrich Nietzsche, a German reprobate who hated God and was like in love with his own sister. Ugh. He believed that one of these days man was going to overcome all of this God religion stuff and become a superman. So then years later, here comes two German Jews, Joel Siegel, Jerry Schuster. New York, and they create a character from the planet called Secret. Oh, no, excuse me. The planet's called Krypton, which means secret. And the word Krypton, meaning secret, means something that's sealed like a crypt, like dead people. And they create this character, and they call him Ubermensch, Superman, true story. So the Superman, um, the blast of the trumpet represents the creative word by the intoning of which man is liberated from his terrestrial limitations in this, but see, I got to stop right here because in the blowing of these trumpets, Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Poor Manly Hall. He just, he just didn't get it. Because when the fifth angel sounded, a star falls from heaven, and to him is given the key of the bottomless pit. And once he's released and he opens up the bottomless pit, then all of these devils start flying out with stingers in their tails, and they sting all of mankind. And for five months, mankind wants to die, but he can't. He's in such agony that he would give anything to be able to die, but he can't die. Nobody dies for five months. Mm. In the... In, um, in the pseudo-Egyptian tarot, it is evident that the three figures signify the parts of a single being, for three mummies are shown emerging from one mummy case. Mm -mm -mm. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy. And we're going to start looking at more of these mysteries in relation to other prophecies that were given in the Scriptures. Prophecies that where God specifically warned us about other gods that so far we've never known before that are coming to this earth. Deuteronomy 13, 1, and I've used this before, but watch this. 
If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Other gods which thou hast not known. God has reserved these angels under the ground now for all the time that they did what they did in the days of Noah. And he's never let them out yet. These gods are going to be released at the sounding of the fifth trumpet. And people are going to say, let us go after these gods. We've never known these gods before. Let us go after them. And even show signs and wonders and, and, and dream dreams and tell the dreams and the dreams come to pass. And then people are going to follow these false teachers. And God is going to send these false teachers so that the people on the earth at that time, which it could be our generation. This is why I've been telling you, please, please, please read your Bible. Become very familiar with what your Bible says. Read it, know it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it. Think on these things, the Bible says. Because the false teachers are going to come out and I'm telling you, if you're not on God's A list, and he's only got one list, and it's the A list. And if you're not on God's A list, he's going to turn you over to believe the false prophets. Because some of you already believe the false prophets that are all over the internet. You believe everything they say. You believe everything that they make up. You accept what they say with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. And I'm warning you, don't do that. Follow the Bible, will you? Follow the scriptures. Deuteronomy 28. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. I've read quite a few abduction stories where adults would, um, under hypnotic regression, after realizing something's been going on, that they've been abducted by these devils only to find out under hypnotic regression that their children have been being abducted too. And while that troubles them greatly, they realize that there isn't a thing they can do about it. My hope in trying to reach these people with the truth is to let them know that Jesus Christ can break that cycle. Because generally, and this is what John Mack figured out and a lot of other, Bud Hopkins figured this out, a lot of other researchers who into human alien abductions was what they realized was when they found an adult generation that was being abducted, if those people had kids, almost without fail, their children were abducted. And then they realized that these adults as children were being abducted as well. And more than likely, some of them find out that their parents were being abducted. It's a generational thing. And my hope is 
is that you would understand that while God said that he visits the iniquity of the fathers under the third and fourth generation, is that Christ came to die on the cross to stop all of the generational curses. And that you and your children can be safe again from never being abducted, ever, if you will follow and trust in Jesus Christ. Because these aliens, they're devils. They were stealing your parents, they were stealing you as a child, and now they're stealing your children. Look at what it says. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway. You're living under oppression and there's nothing you can, you can scream horror, and it's like they don't care. Those aliens don't care, do they? It doesn't bother them. They have no emotion toward us. To, they're, we're like ants to them. We step on ants all day long, don't think nothing. We don't have ant funerals for all the ants that we step on. And they don't care how bad it hurts you and your children. They don't care. Deuteronomy 28, 36, And the Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. Think about that. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. Now, let me just ask you a question. You know, my father grew up, he was a, a baby boomer, he grew up after World War II. He was born in uh, 19, uh, 1941, so right after World War II started. But he, he knew all the nations of the world. He took geography class, graduated high school. He knew all the nations of the world. His mom and dad, they grew up, they were educated. They grew up on farms, but they were educated enough to read and write and spell and everything. And they knew all the nations of the world. So when it says unto a nation which neither, neither thou nor thy fathers have known, what, what nation could that be? It can't be a nation here anywhere on this earth hiding away somewhere. It has to be a nation that they're not from this world. They're from another place. Deuteronomy 28, 42, All thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. The locust are what we just read. Genesis or Revelation chapter 9, at the blowing of the trumpets. Manly Hall thinks that at the blowing of the trumpets, that it's going to be great for everybody worldwide. Everybody's going to rise up from the dead life that they've been living, and we're all going to become the new man. But that's not what's going to happen. The locust, in Revelation 9, the locust is going to come out of the pit of hell. And they're going to sting because they're going to have the stingers of scorpions, and they're going to sting all of mankind. And mankind is going to be in so much pain that he's going to wish he's going, he could die. But for five months, he can't die. Doesn't sound so good, does it? And then he says this, Deuteronomy 28. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, that's the iron kingdom, until he have destroyed thee. And the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth. Remember what we talked about last time. The end of the earth is the Kármán line where the earth's atmosphere ends and all of the airspace of every nation stops. 
It's a jurisdictional line. They're going to come from the end of the earth, meaning they're not coming from this planet. They're coming from the heavens. From the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And only those of you who have encountered these aliens or these spirits who have heard them speak or have seen their writings on their ships, you know what that is. They speak in a language. I mean, what language on earth right now is there that no one understands? They even cracked the Voynich Code, the book that was written that nobody knew what it, they thought some alien wrote it, but it, they found out, no, they finally broke the code, the Voynich Code, the, the book. Go look that up. They finally broke the code. There isn't a language that we don't know on this earth. But they speak one that nobody knows. Whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil. Remember the corn, wine, and the oil? Or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he hath destroyed thee. Now that nation is coming. And there's nothing going to stop it. There's an event. There's going to be a war in heaven. You see, some of the, some of the alien positive people, I call them alien positive because they're in favor of the, they say there's good aliens and bad aliens. The alien positive people, they have been told by what they call the good aliens that there's bad aliens that they're at war with. And the war has been going on for thousands, billions of years. And they're here to protect our planet from these aliens that they've been fighting against. Well, let me kind of straighten all this up for you. The good angels that God has on his side, Michael and his angels, two-thirds of the heavenly hosts that serve Jesus Christ, they're the good guys. All of these alien races, the Nordics, the Draconians, the Greys, they're evil. They're evil from their core. They appear. Satan himself shall appear as an angel of light, the Bible says. He will look like one of the good guys. People, he will look and appear as if he's God and everybody's going to worship him as God. But he's not God. And one third of the angels, yes, there is a war that has been going on for millennium. And it's going to continue to go on until Michael overcomes Lucifer and his angels. And Lucifer takes a third of his angelic army and casts them down to the earth. And according to the New Agers and the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians and all of the other secret societies and secret mystery religions, that's going to be the greatest day ever because they're going to come and join with us. Calling occupants of interplanetary craft. We want you to come down. They make it sound so good and so pretty, that beautiful, wonderful day when these angels come glowing down on the earth and they want to join with us and people are going to let them. But you're going to find out that that's going to seal your doom. And I want to warn you, 
to be ready against that day and not be fooled because those are evil angels. They're devils, demons that you want to call them. And they mean to destroy all of mankind and prevent mankind from ever worshiping the true God again. Now, I've, I've, I've got more evidence that I'm going to show as, as time goes on. But I'm telling you, this event where these angels come down, it literally is going to be the most significant day ever. But it's not going to be to the favor of mankind. Only Jesus Christ can save you from the events that are going to take place that day. Will you put your trust in Him? And it's just as easy as believing. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just that simple. Would you commit yourself to Jesus Christ today? Because I don't know when that day is going to happen. It could happen tonight, tomorrow, a year from now, 10 years from now. I don't know. But I got ready a long time ago since I didn't know what day it was going to happen. And I'm ready to be on the side with Jesus Christ and not these evil angels. This is Pastor Mike. I've just touched the tip of the iceberg of this thing. A lot more information I'll be sharing with you as time goes on on this issue. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.